Good morning. T-O-K. What do you know? Not much. You? I want to do something really different today. Um, I want to break down the structure a little bit. I just want to want to talk T-O-K. I want to have a, a theory of knowledge moment, an exploration of some ideas in theory of knowledge. Um, rather than just talking about theory of knowledge, we're going to do something today. I was thinking about maps today. Um, I'm sure you remember in an earlier video I posted about uh, the map of the world and how it, the world map isn't what you think it is. We had the quote from the West Wing about cartographers for social, uh, for social equality. Um, I believe I shared that with you. If I didn't, I'm sure someone will tell me, hey, McZee, you didn't share that with us. We have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but I was thinking about maps. Now, when I was, when I was young, I, I remember when I was a boy, summer of art, no, wait, that wasn't me. No, I, I remember when I was a, a young person, say 10, 12 years old, the big deal was to go to the mall. Um, indoor shopping centers called shopping malls, uh, invented right here in, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, North Park is considered the first modern mall. And Dallas was famous for its malls, many of which have now closed, because it turns out that in the age of Amazon and Costco, people don't need to go to a large complex of, of stores and wander through uh, a, a half mile track of, of retail spaces uh, to get 30 different, 40 different stores that each specialize in one thing. But the mall was a big player. Uh, each mall usually had two or sometimes three levels. Um, 30 to 40 different stores, including what were called anchor stores, the big, the, the big box stores like uh, J.C. Penney, Sears, um, J.C. Penney, Sears, Wards. Uh, there were large stores, but there were also small stores, um, software, etc., which is where you could go buy floppy disks with computer games on them. Uh, for your personal computer. There were bookstores, usually two or three in each mall, because the only way you could buy books, really, was to go to a bookstore where they were physically on the shelf. There were several shoe stores, several um, clothing stores uh, for men, several clothing stores for women, several clothing stores for children. Uh, you see the pattern here. There was a food court with lots of different restaurants. Um, this, these malls still exist. You've probably been to one. But it was an, it was an event. Um, everything from getting new glasses to getting a new pair of tennis shoes for the, do the, for the back to school shopping for the first day of school, uh, you'd go to the mall. I remember as a child being very impressed when I went to the mall and there was this, this big presentation. There was a, a map, a graphical representation of all of the different levels and all the different stores in the mall. And on this map, there was always one feature that fascinated me. Somewhere on the map, there'd be an orange dot. And that orange dot, in, in bright white letters, would have the, this magical phrase. You are here. I always wondered, how did they know? How did the map know I was there? I mean, when I woke up that morning, I didn't even know I was going to the mall. My mother said, Matthew, get your shoes. We're going to the mall. And I said, okay. The idea of a map is complicated. Um... It turns out there are many cultures which never develop the map, which never develop a graphical representation of location. So what's the relationship between the map and the territory? 
the physical area represented in an abstract and reductionist fashion by the map. Our, our brains aren't very good at holding really complex abstract concepts. Um, we can't remember where all the stores in the mall are. We don't remember which way is north, which way is west. Which floor is the cookie shop on at the mall? Is it in the food court or is it between the food court and Sears? Um, I know it's in the mall somewhere. Because last time I went to the mall, I bought a cookie. Maps allow us to simplify, analogize, to create a representation, a model. Models are wonderful things. And I don't mean that like the Victoria's Secret models, although I suppose they're, they're wonderful too in their own, their own way. No, I mean systems to represent complexity with simplicity are fabulous. Uh, I'm sure that all of you in, in chemistry or physics have seen the model of the atom, where there is a, a nucleus with one or more protons, possibly some number of neutrons, and whizzing around in, in an orbit around it are, are a corresponding number of electrons. A atoms don't look like that. Um, that is a simplification, and it's a simplification that's used for the very simple reason that it works. Just as the big representation with the orange dot that says you are here is not an accurate representation of the reality of the mall, it's a abstraction. It's a simplification. It's what's called reductionist. It's taking the complexity and boiling it down. If I find out that the cookie shop is next to Foot Locker, which is between the food court and Sears, I didn't need to. I don't need to know how many steps. I don't need to know its GPS coordinates. I don't need my smartphone telling me take 31 steps and your destination is on the left. No, I need to walk along until I see Foot Locker and then go. Okay, it's right around here. Uh, Sears is that way. There's Foot Locker. Oh, cookie shop! Fantastic. Let's get cookies. Well, models are incredibly handy because our brain can deal with a model much more readily than it can with the complexity of real life. Um, I'm reminded of a quote by George Box who said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Think back to the, the atom. It's not an accurate depiction of what the atom looks like. Um, there's no neat orbit with the electron going round and round in a circle. Um, we know from quantum mechanics that we can't even tell you exactly where an electron is. Uh, there's the uncertainty principle, uh, which, which says that there is a limit to our ability to accurately describe the physical universe at, at the very small scale. But it's a useful model. It turns out you can do an awful lot of chemistry with the basic model of the atom because it represents the complex way in which, in which real atoms interact, uh, form compounds, molecules, and so on. The, the model is wrong, but it's useful. Stereotypes work the same way. When we decide that um, all athletes are emotionally stunted and withdrawn, or that that all math teachers are abstract and and uh, high order thinking, that all poets are foolish and romantic. Those aren't true, but the generalizations behind the stereotypes sometimes are useful. Um, if you're going to, a to ask which of your instructors is more likely to understand epic and romance, 
statistically speaking, your poetry teacher is a better bet than your statistics teacher. You do rarely find a statistics teacher who's also a poet. There's a limitation to stereotypes. But a, the more accurate a map is, the more it directly corresponds to reality, the less useful it becomes. If you think about it, an absolutely perfect map would have no reduction, no simplification. It would be a reproduction in life of the thing. The map would be the territory. Um, the comedian Stephen Wright says, I have a map of the United States, actual size. It says scale, one mile equals one mile. I spent last summer folding it. I hardly ever unroll it. People ask me where I live, and I say, E6. You can imagine this map would be useless. On the other hand, a map of the universe that was labeled the universe, with an orange dot in the middle that said, you are here. It would be accurate. It would also be useless. Um, a lot of times we don't understand that our maps have limits, that our maps are in some way simplifications. We tend to think of the map is the territory. Um, Alfred Korzybski uh, was a mathematician and semanti semantician, semantician, guy who does semantics. He was a one of the more brilliant thinkers of his day. And he gave a presentation where, among other things, he said that the, a famous quote, the map is not the territory, that there is a fundamental difference between the representation of the thing and the thing itself. Um, he went on to apply this to language, where he said, the word for a thing is not the thing itself. The idea of the thing is not the thing itself. The word ice cream cone and the mental conception of an ice cream cone are both different from an actual ice cream cone. But there is a relationship there which might prove useful. But when you forget that the map is not the territory, when you forget that, that there are limitations to our expressions, to our abstraction, you run across ridiculous situations. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, I had a, a former student, a good friend of mine now, uh, named Santonio. And one night, uh, I was leaving school very late, and in the parking lot, I saw Santonio on his hands and knees under a, a, a street light, under a, a parking lamp, in the a, a lamppost in the parking lot. And I came over to him and I said, Santonio, what are you, what are you doing? And he says, oh, Mrs. C, he says, I lost my keys. Can you help me look? I was like, Okay. So I'm looking, and he's looking. He's down on his hands and knees. I've got my, my cell phone like a flashlight. Not a smartphone in those days. I had the, the, the Nokia. Okay. And we looked for quite a while, and I finally said, San Antonio, are you sure they're over here? And he says, no, no, I, I lost them over by the gym. Then what are we doing looking over here? He looks at me, he, he looks at me like I'm an idiot. And he goes, well, Mr. C, this is where the light is. Understanding the difference between the representation of the thing, the, the process, and the thing itself is, is important. Um, in Santonio's case, he's using an imperfect model uh, of the possible location of his keys 
because this imperfect model under the lamp in the parking lot is preferable to no model at all somewhere near the gym. Um, you look where the light is. This is very similar um, to a man named McGurk, who was a famous bank robber. And they, he wasn't particularly good at it, I guess, because they kept catching him and they'd send him to court and he'd be found guilty and he'd go to jail. And then he'd get out of jail and he, he would rob another bank. And finally, one day, the judge who was sentencing him for his latest crime says, Mr. McGurk, why do you insist on robbing the on on robbing banks? You're clearly not very good at it. We keep catching you. Why do you rob banks? And McGurk shrugs and looks at the judge and says, "Well, that's where the money is." What we're saying here is that some kind of model is preferable to no model at all because our brains crave an understandable abstraction. Um, this brings us to uh, a couple of interesting quotes, I think, about maps. Um, these are from the Canadian Geographic Society. Um, the first one is by Mark Jenkins, who said, Maps encourage boldness. They're like cryptic love letters. They make anything seem possible. And this is the idea that because maps are simplifications, because they're reductions of reality, our imagination is free to fill in the gaps. Um, in medieval period, when they created a map of the known world, which was usually a distorted vision of the relationship of various land masses and seas that they had explored, there was always unknown at the margins. And it became fashionable to say at the unknown margin of the map, here be dragons the idea that beyond our conceptual model lies the unknown. Um, Peter Greenaway said about maps, I've always been fascinated by maps and cartography. That's the science of, of map making. A map tells you where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. In a sense, it's three tenses in one, the past, present, and future, all all graphically represented for us. I think that's a beautiful idea. Um, the fantasy author Terry Pratchett uh, commented that geography is just physics slowed down with a couple of trees stuck in it. The idea that a map is a snapshot of physical processes uh, in a incredibly uh, complex interaction Flash frozen. Um, and finally, uh, Jimmy Buffett, the musician. Without geography, he said, you're nowhere. Maps give us a sense of identity, of location. Um, many of us grow to embrace maps. We grow, grow to embrace the idea, we recognize the silhouette of our own state or our own nation. And when presented with, with other states and other nations, we're often terribly confused unless it's on a map that shows it in relation to our personal tender territory, the, the location we know and embrace as our own. Uh, I've got a little bit of uh, video and a couple of graphics to share with you, but I want you to take this time and I want you to really think about maps. If you were to map your day, how would you represent it? If you were to map your high school fields of study, what features are essential and what's reduction? What's left off the map for clarity? And finally, if you were to map knowledge, would you use the TOK diagram? Or would you find a different way to represent it? How would you represent the process of knowing? That's something we'll come back to. And later this term, 
I will actually ask you to create an alternative TOK diagram. So I'd like you to be thinking about that idea. All right, let's go ahead and get to the next materials. So what follows here is a collection of, uh, of interesting maps. Uh, it's from the Twitter feed, Terrible Maps. Uh, terrible can mean awful or, uh, or, or bad, but terrible can also mean terrifying or inspiring awe. Uh, I think these are both. Uh, the first is the cat earth theory, uh, as you can see illustrated here. Um, for those of you who had not realized it, the earth is in fact a cat and uh, it's playing with Australia. I think that speaks for itself. Now, most of us are used to looking at a map and thinking that north is at the top and south is at the bottom. Things get a little more complex when we're talking about Antarctica, which is south at the middle and north, also north, north to, still north, north, north again, other north. Um, every bay in Antarctica is the North Bay because south is the pole. Now, between Southern Europe and, and Turkey uh, lies a region called the Balkans. Uh, the Balkans during the Cold War was the home to a, a synthetic or an artificial state called Yugoslavia, which after the fall of the Soviet Union and uh, the end of the Cold War broke up into its constituent countries, including Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia and Serbia Montenegro. Um, this map makes fun of the fact that Croatia takes all of the coastline uh, all the way down to Montenegro, meaning that Bosnia and all of the cities, which used to be Bosnian ports, uh, are now isolated, now landlocked. Uh, the ports are, are part of Croatia, so the Bosnians say, I want to swim, and Croatia says, no. And while we're on the subject of swimming, this is my favorite map of Saudi Arabia. This is a map of Saudi Arabia depicting only its rivers. Here we see a map of Poland. Um, a, this is a map of all of the churches in Poland, and you can see that... Uh, well, it's sort of the opposite of the Saudi Arabian River problem. Um, Poland is a very, very, very religious place. Uh, almost all of those churches are Catholic churches. There are some Protestant churches. There used to be a fair number of synagogues, uh, but in 1939, the invasion of Poland, uh, its partition between Germany and the USSR, its subsequent occupation and reoccupation, uh, this little thing called the Holocaust. Well, let's just say there are substantially fewer synagogues in Poland now, but still plenty of churches. And if Poland seems a little too religious for you, here is a map of the United Kingdom. Um, Every pub, a pub or public house is a, a local bar. This is every pub in the United Kingdom. And if you're wondering about Ireland over there in the, uh, in the southwest, the Republic of Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom and therefore does not count. And now it's time for a list because people love lists, this is the top 10 countries based on how round they are. Uh, with Uruguay, uh, Uruguay has a 0.894 roundness um, at number 10, uh, Scarborough Reef, Ivory Coast, but check out Sierra Leone. 
Sierra Leone is 0.934 roundness. That's about as round as you can get in a real world map. Well done, Sierra Leone. Now, a lot of maps will reorder countries um, or resize countries based on things like their population or their carbon footprint. This is a fascinating map. This is a depiction of the countries of the world arranged exactly by their geographical location. Hey, no, wait, um, never mind. Just like we can map rivers or churches or pubs, this is a map of the entire world uh, consisting entirely of the time zones. Um, by the way, my favorite time zone is in Canada, where the maritime provinces of Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador are a half hour different from the surrounding areas. They have a half hour time zone. Um, that's just fun. Now it's time for a quick joke about a bear attack, because nothing's funnier than a bear attack. Um, my friend Lewis and I were playing uh, a, a Wii sports game one night, uh, and he said, wow, you're, you're really getting fast. You're going to beat me. And I said, well, you know, I practiced by being chased by a bear. And he looked at me and he said, there's no way you could outrun a bear. And I said, you, Lewis, you don't understand. I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. So here's a chart, a map, that helps us determine the risk of bear attacks. Um, Mercury and Venus have no risk of bear attack. Earth has a, relatively speaking, really very high risk of bear attack. And then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune... Uh, uh, also, no real risk of bear attack. So, plan accordingly. Now, if you're like me, I'm sure just countless times you've wondered how many Switzerlands fit in Brazil. Um, well, here's a map. And as you can see, if you count carefully, how many Switzerlands fit, or excuse me, according to the title, how many Switzerlands fits in Brazil? The answer is more than two. Now, here we have uh, two maps in one. It's a map that teaches us a little history lesson. In green, you see countries that use the metric system. Uh, that includes, by the way, Antarctica, which, although it is not a country, the Antarctic research stations by international treaty do use the metric system. The only, uh, only nation not using the metric system is that nation which lost wars to Vietnamese farmers. I have a special place in my heart for this map. My good friend Steven sent this to me uh, on my birthday a couple of years ago. This is a map of electricity consumption in Europe in 1507, um, ranging from zero kilowatt hours to zero kilowatt hours. Sometimes when we look at the world, we just need a change in perspective. Um, if Antarctica was, in fact, the center of the world, uh, it would look very much like this. Okay, fun fact. Uh, I mentioned bear attacks earlier, and I've talked about Antarctic. Um, the word for the species of bear um, in, in America, we have the grizzly bear which is Ursus arctos horribilis. Um, Ursus uh, is Greek for bear, or excuse me, Latin for bear. Arctos is Greek for bear, and horribilis means uh, horrible. So that is the horrible bear bear. 
And if that seems like a lot of bear, the uh, the um, European or the North American brown bear, I believe, is Ursus arctos arctos, or the bear bear bear, the most bear you can bear. Um, and finally, the Arctic is named not uh, the, the bears aren't named for the Arctic. The Arctic is named for the polar bears. Um, Arctic literally means the area with bears. Antarctic is no bears. So Antarctica literally is the land of no bears. I don't know what that has to do with map making, but I laugh every time I think about it. Bear, bear, bear. Um, we now, as we get towards the end, we have a very, very simple map. Uh, this is a map of the Earth if there was no land. And for our last of the terrible maps, I don't think this one's terrible at all. I think this is terrible maybe in the sense of awe-inspiring in its awesomeness. Uh, this map represents the legality of owning a kangaroo in the United States. Most of the U.S., as you see in red, uh, it is in fact illegal to own a kangaroo. In Wisconsin, West Virginia, and South Carolina, there is unlimited ownership of kangaroos without a permit. But in Texas and New Mexico and the other states designated in orange, such as uh, Pennsylvania or Idaho, you can only own a kangaroo with a permit. I don't know where you get this permit, but now I want one. And that brings us to the end of our TOK discussion of maps, at least for today. We will look at conceptual maps, word maps, uh, knowledge maps, and other types of maps in the future. Um, but we end with a friendly orange sign a big orange dot that says, you are here. I know. How did I know? I'm just that good. I hope you've enjoyed TOK maps and models, and I look forward to our next lesson together. Have a great day.